Neurogenesis is the idea that, or the process that our brains actually create new neurons. So I, I don't know about all of you, but I grew up believing that, you know, once you damage a brain cell or a neuron, it's gone forever. So good luck, you know. Um, and th that's actually not the case. We know that or, or evidence is suggesting that neurogenesis does occur throughout life. And again, it, it's a process that slows as we get older. And that makes a lot of sense if you think of a, a newborn and their, brain, their brains are just incredible how much the neuronal growth they're, they're going through and synaptic connections they're building and they, they go through that until around the age of three where you just see this increase, increase, increase of neurons, neuronal size connections forming. And then around the age of three, they enter into a state of um, pruning, it's, it's called pruning or cell death, but pruning is, sounds much better where you see those communications simplify and streamline. So it's, um, it makes a lot of sense if you're around a lot of three-year-olds and what they're going through behaviorally and developmentally. Um, but it's, so even though it most profoundly occurs at that early stage in life, it's something that occurs throughout life, but it's also good to be aware. So you'll hear um, just how there's a lot of excitement about neuroplasticity. There's a lot of excitement about neurogenesis because this is good news, um, but it is relatively, relatively small. So if we have around 100 billion neurons in an adult brain, neurogenesis accounts for around 700 new neurons added per day in the brain, in the hippocampus. And um, there are similar factors to neuroplasticity support neurogenesis. So sleep, nutrition, exercise, learning, play. We haven't talked about play yet, but play, play encompasses that challenge component of neuroplasticity, attention focus, all can also support processes of neurogenesis. So you'll hear like uh, um, Andrew Huberman is not so excited about neurogenesis and, and tends to downplay it when I've heard him talk about it. In my program, there was a lot of excitement about it and the research coming out that supports it. So I think you just, you, you decide how excited you want to be about it, but <laughs> that's good news to me. So well, you know, that. it is, it is proportionate. You bring that up. It's like when you're looking at billions of neurons, 700 new neurons a day is not a whole lot, but the idea of genesis, you know, we have angiogenesis where our arteries and capillaries regenerate. We have peripheral nerve regeneration. We know that we've known that forever that, and you have to create the demand for the peripheral nerve to regenerate. So, you know, that it would make sense that there would be uh, regeneration or neurogenesis in the central nervous system. Uh, the, I think the challenge we have is finding the data to show, you know, how that works and, and maybe the difference between something like a central pattern generator in a cat versus a central pattern generator in a human. And, the research trying to activate those with people who've had spinal cord injuries and using stem cells to be able to speed up the neurogenesis uh, inside the brain and inside the spinal cord. So either way, whether it's ex exogenous or endogenous, it's, you know, we're, I think we're going to figure it out. It is a very exciting time to, you know, be involved in neuroscience. Yeah. 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 And it's always better to have more positive impressions of the processes of your brain and body and spirit, And so it's, it's very limiting to think that, oh, you know, what you're born with is what you'll have for forever. But we know IQ can change. IQ is not a fixed, a fixed measurement. We now know that our neurons, can, you know, we can grow new neurons. We can, we can do all sorts of things. As you know, in, the, in, in the past, Kate, we thought of, you know, that we only use this really small percentage of our brain. So even if the brain cells were dying and we were exercising our brain, we could expand things like, you know, int intelligence, emotional intelligence, um, that we could expand that uh, capacity. So it's interesting to think of, you know, are we, are we really only using a small portion of our brain or do we use our whole brain and we just keep having neurogenesis and neuroplasticity of connecting the things that we're learning because individuals. I remember I had a patient uh, that was in his 80s and he was a very, very intelligent uh, man. And he 
always was learning. So I remember him, he was, he was the dean of the medical school at the University of Miami for many years. And after, long after he retired, he would still go back to school every semester and take a literature course, a Latin course, a mathematics course. And he just believed in continually learning. And his memory was phenomenal. Like we, he would come see me and he would remember all of my children's names. And I remember when he passed away, I thought to myself, you know, Lizette, I really need to go to his service because I was really special to him. He remembered our family's name. And I went there, there were like 4,000 people that all felt the same exact way. And I thought, what a capacity. But he really never stopped learning. Learning music, music was a huge passion of his. So you think of the different parts of the brain, art. So he had the visual, he loved nature, he listened to music, he challenged his mathematical brain all the way up until the day he passed away. I mean, um, he passed away just the way he wanted to. He didn't want to have loss of any kind of intelligence or memory. He just wanted to have that sudden stroke and that's exactly what happened to him. But it's interesting that I think we so often associate all these things with age. You know, oh, you know, the arthritis and the memory loss and the balance loss. And the reality is there was a great study done in Miami that looked primarily at physiology of conditioning, exercise physiology in individuals or men in particular over 90 years old. And the men that survived the study, obviously they have a high attrition <laughs> over 90, but the men that survived the study showed incredible changes even after you know 90 of change in muscle mass of power of elasticity that was just based on challenging tissue and tissue adaptation so i can't imagine it being any different for the nervous system i think we just you know what we want to be careful of is not using it for so long and then trying to use it later on and it, it still will be plastic but i think that you know we don't the odds are better for us to be motivating people to be active mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, emotionally, you know, their whole life. And that's going to have the greatest likelihood of maintaining the, the health of the brain and, and uh, the rest of the body. And being a beginner, being a yeah, beginner always, throughout life. Yeah. Always, yeah. Yeah, the only person that can really limit yourself is yourself. You know, there, there's just... And that's, a, that's an incredible story about the, the Dean that you just mentioned. You hear that and think, oh, how, you know, how can I, how can I be better and, and do that more? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you were talking about the fact that there was a, they call it a neuro myth, this idea that we only use 10% of our brain. And so then some people would think like, oh, well, I, I can relax a little bit. I don't need to worry about the other 90%. <laughs> It's all there for a reason and everything is so interconnected and just we also know now that functions aren't truly isolated to certain regions, but everything is interwired and interwoven and connected that um, that it's it's much more much more communicative, which makes more sense anyways. It's yeah. how, how could anything be so cleanly bundled and isolated? Um, it's I, I just you know the more the more we learn as we say, the more we know, the more we know we don't know and it just becomes more and more fascinating. And even when we listen to some really, really intelligent scientists and the first thing that they admit is just how little we know. Um, you know, there's just, it's, you think of looking in the expanse of the heavens, you know, and the new telescope and what it's providing for us. And it's like, it's still a scratch of the cosmos. And when we then drill down into the nervous system, it's like, to me, it's like the same thing. It's like looking into the cosmos of understanding how the nervous system works.